know that Brian and, uh, and David are, are thankful that you've come out to attend these services. And before we get started, we're just going to go to the Lord and pray to ask Him to bless our time together, okay? Father, we love You and we praise You, Lord. And God, we're just so thankful for the opportunity to gather in Your house. Lord, just as we've come today to, Lord, affirm the call of Brian and David and the Deacon Ministry, Lord, to serve you and to serve your church. God, I just pray that you just bless this time. Lord, I, I pray that, Lord, we would understand the seriousness of this time. And God, what a great honor and privilege has been bestowed upon them to be called servants of God. And Lord, I just pray that you bless them all the days of their life, bless their ministry. Lord, and bless this church. Father, just help us. Lord, each one of us that is present today, God, to keep our eyes focused solely on you. Lord, because you are so worthy of our praise for all that you've done. Most especially for our salvation, that you paid the highest price at Calvary for. And we thank you for that and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
and everything. Eventually, I moved them back up, up there where my parents did live at and everything. Um, was up there and went through some more uh, deaths in the family, and I kept asking why. Why? And everything. And started going back to church up there, and uh, everything. I knew the Lord's been dealing with my heart there for a little while. Got up there on one Sunday, preacher was preaching. <coughs> And I knew the Lord was dealing with my heart. I mean, it was one of these that it was, I thought it was my last chance at getting, at being, at being saved. So, as soon as the preacher got done preaching, started invitation, I ran up there fast as I could. Got down on my altar, prayed, asked the Lord to come into my heart and everything. Got baptized shortly after that. You know, come back down here. Still didn't live the life that, you know, the Lord would want you to live and everything. Got married, had kids, got back on into church, you know. But we were still not on the right path as a family. I'm going to church and everything. And uh, about four or five years ago, we went through some financial stuff that, you know, we just kind of gave it to God and see how God would have his way with it. And at, at that point that, you know, that I put, I got a lot of faith in God. All my faith is in God at this point you now. And it's just been blessings after blessings after that. Bibles turned to Acts 
chapter 6. Let me say this is a beautiful bill. Chapter 6, I'm going to read the first four verses. It says, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Father God, we come before you, dear Lord, asking you for your Word by your Holy Spirit to speak in our hearts. Praying for these two men, dear God, that you've called out to do your ministry. Father, just in the next few minutes, Father, just speak to us and speak to them about our service to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, many times in ordination and deacon ordinations, the passage of 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13 is used as a text because it gives the qualifications for deacons. It even tells something about their wives. And it says they should be reverent, they should not be double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy over money, uh, believers of the Word, and they should be, should be tested. They should be new believers. The husbands of one wife are in their household as well, and that their wives shouldn't be slanderers or troublemakers. And as I was preparing this message, it dawned on me that, you know, if you get to this stage of the process and you don't know them qualifications, we're probably too late. Isn't it? So, <laughs> knowing the pastor you have as I do, I know he's already talked to you about this, so I'm going in a different direction. I'm going in a direction I believe God wants me to go in today. And as a matter of fact, Acts 6, 1 through 4, isn't going to be my major text. But I do want us to see a few things here before we move on. There in verse 1, it said, In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. First, and we'll come back to this later, but the deacon ministry started out of a problem in the church. That's encouraging, folks. <laughs> How many of you know churches have problems? Everybody here. Man. Then the, I hear people say all the time, I just want to join a church with no problems. And you know what they just said is? I'm going to join a dead church. Amen. Because the only church that ain't got any problems is a church that's dead. Right. You go down to the funeral home and try to start you an argument with the corpse. <laughs> because it's dead. Now listen, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, and if you think brothers and sisters don't ever fight, you are an only child. <laughs> brothers and sisters disagree. Sometimes brothers and sisters fight, but they still love each other. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah. Don't let somebody jump on your brother or sister. Yeah. You'll have yeah. them to the death. Yeah. But they will fight. And that's family. The church is the family of God. Yeah. We're to love each other even when we don't like each other. Now here the church is growing. It says the number of disciples were growing. The twelve apostles, the ones preaching the word, they were trying to do it all themselves and it wasn't working. They, they couldn't get to everyone to meet everyone's needs. Now let me say this. As hard as he may try, and I know he puts a lot of time into it, your pastor can't get to everyone. Right. He can't be everywhere all the time. And, and even if they think he should, he's only human. And he has another job, he has another, he has a family of his own. And even if he didn't have to work, he still couldn't get everything done that you might think he needs to do. Because he needs to do what God calls him to do. God didn't call him to do everything. God called him to one main thing, especially. Verse 2 said, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it's not desirable that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. See, as your pastor and as the preacher, his number one priority is the Word of God. It's to study the Word of God to get a word from God. Yeah. And that's why we call him a preacher. 
Because that's what God called him to do, to preach. And as a pastor, he should visit the lost, and he should visit the sick, and he should minister to the church, but he's not the only one to do it. And neither are the deacons, but they should lead in that. Every church member is to be a minister. Everyone can visit, everyone can call, everybody can be concerned about others and serving the church. Verse 3 says, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Now, here it gives four qualifications for deacons. And since these were the first deacons, the first time they ever chose deacons, I think they probably should get the most consideration. Number one, it says, Brethren, seek out among you. In other words, they've got to be a believer. Yeah. And you're probably like, well, well, duh, I guess so. Well, no, they need to know that they know that they know. Yeah, right. They're so. yeah. I've met a few deacons in my life that if you ask them if they were going to heaven, they would tell you, I hope so. Now, how are you ever going to tell somebody to get someplace you don't know you're going yourself? Right. 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 Number two, it says, a good reputation. The only way to get a good reputation is with time. It means it has to be someone that's been around for a while. And doing the right thing <coughs> coming to church every time the door's open. See, you can't be a leader at the church if you're not at church. Can you? Amen. Our nominating committee is meeting. And yours may be too. <laughs> and nobody said this yet. But they probably will because I have not been around a nominating committee yet. Somebody did not say this. Let's give them a job so that they'll come to church. <laughs> Bless God, if they won't come to church because they love Jesus, give them a job, they're going to get them to church. <laughs> and what you're going to have is you're going to have a church and they're never going to get a job and they're never going to get done. But I've come up with an answer for this, Jim. So next time I hear this, this is what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, okay, let's make up a job that we don't need and we'll give it to them. <laughs> like third street saxophone player when we ain't got a saxophone. <laughs> and when they say, well, I don't know how to play saxophone, that don't matter. We need to play no one. We'll just give you a job so you'll come. You know? We're not going to let you play. So, and then, once they come, since everybody thinks this works so good, once they come for a couple of years standing, hey, we'll give them a job that we actually have or we'll buy a saxophone and send pay for this. <laughs> just think that part. Third thing he says, they are be full of the Holy Spirit. See, I hear people say a lot of times, well, he's a good man. He'd make a good deacon. They have one problem with that. The Bible says there are no good. Yeah. No, no good, no, not one. Not by God's name. We don't need good men. We need men full of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We need full men. Fourth qualification. Not only full of the Holy Spirit, but full of wisdom. Notice it says wisdom, not knowledge. There's a big difference. Knowledge is the accumulation of facts. But wisdom is the ability to take the facts and apply it to the needs. And that comes from God. Right. And James said, if any of you have like wisdom, you ask God, he'll give it to you. Right. That should be all of our prayer for these who are ordained as deacons. To fill them with God's Holy Spirit and to give them godly wisdom. Because that's what they mean. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Once again, they selected deacons for the ministry of the church to free up the apostles to focus on those two things. Prayer and ministry of the Word. You know, as much as he may need to and want to be involved in everything, the pastor's number one priority is to pray and get a word from God to give. And it's the deacon's job and the church's job to see who gets the time to do it. Now, all that was just preliminary. That didn't cost you a thing. Actually, none of this cost you a thing because Jeff's come and preached at our church and I preached here and neither one of us going to be paid for it. So that's good. And our people are getting the good deal because they're going to get to hear a good sermon. Y'all had to put up with me. My only concern is Y'all don't know this. Don't listen. Jeff loves to talk. <laughs> and I'm afraid he's going to be here so long after the service, he's not going to get to our church by 6 o'clock. 
So when he comes around and wants to talk, just ignore him, okay? He starts to play. <laughs> that way you'll have to leave. But the rest of our time, I want to talk to everyone. Not just the deacons, although that's important. But to the pastors, to the church members. Because it says there in verse 1 of chapter 6, when the number of the disciples were multiplying, we're all to be disciples. And you can't be a good church member. You can't be a good deacon. You can't be a good pastor unless you're willing to first be a good disciple. So in the next few minutes, I'd want us to look at not what I think a disciple is, but what Jesus thinks a disciple is because that's all that really matters is what He says. So turn to Luke chapter 14. We're going to start at verse 25. See, the word disciple actually means learner. And the one we're to learn from is Jesus Christ. Well, there in Luke 14, beginning in verse 25, we'll read 25 through 4, 27. It says, Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be. Now, the first thing I want to see is disciples are worshipers. When you worship someone or something, it means you put it above everything and everyone else. See, when Jesus says, hate our parents or our wives or our husband or children, He's not telling us not to love them. Jesus would never tell us to break one of the commandments like honor our fathers and mothers. Or the Word of God that says to love our wives and honor our husbands, love our kids. The word hate used here by Jesus means to make a clear choice. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, He said, No man can serve two masters. In other words, only one person can be master in your life. And that person is supposed to be Jesus. In Matthew 10, 37, 38, He gives more clarity on this because Jesus said, He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Or loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. See, Jesus intended, He expects us to love our families. Just not more than Him. Because He knows we can't even love our wives and we can't love our husbands. We can't love our kids or honor our parents unless we first love Him. Unless we first worship Him above everything and everyone else. And that type of worship comes at a cost. It's a cost of our time. Sometimes it's a cost of our relationships. Sometimes it costs our own reputation and desires. Matthew 10, 38 also says, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth me is not worthy of me. Verse 27 here says, Disciples bear his cross and follow him. See, the Bible tells us that we bear a cross. In other words, it also says we're to be crucified with Christ. Now, A.W. Tozer told this story about a young man who came to an old saint that taught about a deeper life, a crucified life, and he asked the old man, he said, what does it mean to be crucified with Christ? And the old man thought for a minute, he said, well, to be crucified means three things. He said, first, the man who's crucified is facing only one direction. Second, when you die on the cross, you've said goodbye to everything else. And third, when you're on the cross, you make no further plans of your own. So that's what it means to be a disciple that's crucified with Christ. Going in only one direction. Saying goodbye to the world and letting Jesus make the plans for our life. Disciples are worshipers. Second, disciples are workers. Verse 28 there says, For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. Saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. See, discipleship is a life of building. Crucifixion to the old life is to be followed by construction to a new life. When you're a disciple, God has a plan for your life. But rather than praying and asking God to bless what we're doing, we should pray and ask God that we might do what He is blessing. God needs to be the architect 
of the tower of our life. See, the biggest disgrace isn't to not build. It's to start to build and not finish. Yeah. Right. Verse 29 says, If you lay a foundation, and that's all you do, everyone who sees it will mock you. They'll laugh at you. See, the biggest disgrace to the church isn't, isn't that those that isn't the those that never call the church. It's not those that don't join the church. It's those that join the church and work in the church and quit. Jesus said, if you don't intend to finish, don't even start. Yeah. That just gives scoffers something to scoff about. Right. See, there's always plenty of reasons to quit. But there is the greatest reason to finish, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. See, there'll be no joy in a good start, but there'll be great joy in well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah. Disciples are to be worshipers. Disciples are to be workers. Thirdly, disciples are to be warriors. Verse 31. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. See, being a disciple not only means a crucifixion, not only means a construction, it means a conflict. You remember in Acts 6 we read that, you know, the first deacons were formed out of a conflict. You know, over the years, I've known several deacons who resigned over conflict. We're in a war. We have a real enemy. His name is Satan. Yeah. And we can't throw down our weapons and retreat when he attacks. We can quit, but if we quit, when the battle starts, he's won. We should be like the man who said to his comrades, men were surrounded by the enemy. Don't let any of them stay. You know, we've run around the way from conflict so long in the church that we've almost lost the war. Yeah. And there's a movie coming out in September, and I saw it the other day, and it's called Last Ounce of Courage. Every church member needs to see it. You'll see what we've given up as Christians in this country. Right. And I can't believe they're showing it. I guarantee the ACLU doesn't want to show it. And it'd be worthwhile to buy a ticket to knock Satan in the head, we'll see it. Yeah, right. The church isn't a playground. It's a battlefield. Right. Disciples are worshipers. Disciples are workers. Disciples are warriors. And finally, disciples are witnesses. Verse 34. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor for the dunghill. The men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Salt speaks of our witness and our testimony. See, there's a crucifixion, there's a construction, there's a conflict, but there's also a commission. Jesus said that we would be the salt of the world. See, three things that salt does. Salt preserves, salt flavors, and salt heals. Salt is what prevents decay many times. In the days before freezers, people salted down meat to preserve it. Now the most times they just make meat jerky out of it. You know, when we spread the witness of the gospel, it prevents the decay of sin. The only hope for America, the only thing to preserve this country is more salt. Right, right. Salt preserves, but also salt flavors. In Job 6.6 6, it says, Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? See, I've come to the conclusion is that anything that's good for you don't taste good. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm in good company. Because even God's Word says the white of an egg ain't no good. The young's a lot better. Yeah. Food without salt don't taste good. Yeah. You know, as disciples, our lives should be lived like salt to make others hunger and thirst after Christ. You know, one little boy said, salt is what tastes bad when you don't have it. You know, salt is what makes things taste good. Colossians 4, 6 says, let your speech be always with grace, savored with seasoned with salt, that you may know how to you ought to answer every man. Salt preserves and salt flavors and salt heals. An old remedy for sore throat was to gobble over salt water. 
The Bible says Elisha threw salt into a poisonous spring and healed the water. The salt of the life is a witness for God. It can heal broken homes. It can heal broken lives. It can heal broken hearts. Salt preserves, it flavors, and it heals. But unfortunately, God's Word tells us salt can lose its effectiveness. Matthew 5, 13 says, You're the salt of the world. But if the salt has lost its savor, where will shall it be salty? It's this for good for nothing but to be cast out and trod under foot of men. See, as we said earlier, a deacon should be a man of good reputation. In other words, have a good witness, and we all should. And that's built over time. But it only takes seconds to destroy a reputation, to destroy our witness. And that's not just for deacons, not just for preachers, but for all believers. Before we say or do anything that would damage or destroy our witness, we better think of you. We better count the cost. See, man, if you'll be a good worshiper, if you'll be good workers, if you'll be good warriors, if you'll be good witnesses, you'll be great deacons. But we're all called that ministry. A life that's crucified with Christ, that's constructed in His image, that's conquering conflict, and commissioned as His missionaries and His ambassadors on this earth. Let's pray. Father, we love you and praise you. We thank you for your word. Pray, thank you for the way it speaks to us, dear God. Father, we just pray for this time to ordain these men, dear Lord. Father, that all of us, that you just prick our hearts, that we're to be the salt of this world. If we don't do it, there won't be any salt in this world. And if we don't hurry up salt, there will be a world of salt. But Father, just help us to be the salt that we need to be, the light we need to be. Father, thank you for this church, the ministry of it, for the pastor and all the members. As you bless them, we bless these two men. In Jesus' name we pray. Church as, as we do this. 